and today my talk is on tips for management of refractory ascites. I'm going to discuss on natural history of cirrhosis, refractory ascites, epidemiology and definitions and management of refractory ascites. So on natural history of cirrhosis, a chronic liver cell disease is divided into compensated phase and the decompensated phase. Compensated phase, yeah, the, they have less reduced mortality and survival is high. Average median survival is around more than 12 years. And when clinical significant portal hypertension develops, they progress into rapidly progressing decompensated phase where the mortality is high and the average survival is less than two years. The ascites is the most commonest landmark decompensating event. When ascites is developed, the one-year mortality slides up to 20%. When varicella bleeding is there, one-year mortality increased up to 50%. And refractory ascites is one of the most serious side effect complication of decompensated cirrhosis, where the prevalence is around 5-10% and median survival is around 6 months and one year mortality rises up to 70%. And 20% of patients with refractory ascites found to have an alternative cause for their refractoriness. So International Ascites Club discuss ascites and divided it in main, into main two parts, the uncomplicated ascites and refractory ascites. Uncomplicated ascites is when the ascites is not complicated with infective or non-infective complications. And they divided mainly into three parts, grade one, grade two, and grade three. Grade one is mild ascites, only detectable radiologically. Grade two is moderate ascites. And grade three is gross ascites. And refractory ascites, they again subdivide into type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is diurotic resistant and type 2 is diurotic intractable. And more nicely proposed six criteria for the diagnosis of refractory ascites. And in 2018, European guidelines nicely subdivided these six criteria into subheadings and proposed their recommendations. Where they define treatment duration as patient must be on intensive diuretic therapy for at least one week and on self-restricted diet less than 90. A lack of response, they define as mean weight loss less than 0.8 kilogram over four days and urinary sodium output less than the sodium intake. And early ascites recurrence, reappearance of grade 2 or grade 3 ascites within four weeks of initial mobilization. And diuretic induced complication, they mainly discuss main five complications hepatic encephalopathy, renal lymphoma, hyponatremia, hypo and hyperkalemia, and incapacitating muscle cramps. So on management of refractory ascites is depend mainly on the pathophysiology of ascites. When clinically significant portal hypertension is there, it causes spasmic vasodilatation, which in turn reduces the effective arterial blood flow, which activates the renin-angiotensin system and sympathetic nervous system, which increase urine sodium reabsorption and increase free water retention, which in turn cause ascites. So this different treatment modality act on different steps in this pathophysiological cascade. So in my future slides, I'm going to discuss further about this treatment modalities. So before coming into diagnosis of refractory ascites, it is important to assess the salt and diuretic compliance. You can assess it through history, weight monitoring, and 24-hour urinary sodium excretion. If recommended weight loss is not there and sodium excretion is more than 78, 
that means a patient who is taking usually a patient who is taking five gram of salt excrete around 78 millimoles of liter urinary but if it is more than 78 that means the salt, salt intake is higher than the recommended so we have to recommend to add and here to the salt restriction diet if sodium excretion is less than 78 and recommended weight loss is not there the diuretic dose are not adequate, so we have to increase the diuretic dose. And also, before coming into the diagnosis of refractory ascites, we have to exclude the vascular causes, cardiac causes, malignancies, and infections, because 20% of refractory ascites patients have an alternative course. And proper etiologic treatment was associated with decreased incidence of hepatic decompensation. So in every cirrhotic patient, we have to assess the etiology and refer them for the proper treatment. And about short restriction, the aim of short restriction to prevent sodium accumulation inside the body. This can be achieved by reducing the oral intake of sodium and increasing the urinary excretion of sodium. In studies, the strict salt restriction was associated with better control of ascites, higher spontaneous diuresis, but higher incidence of hyponatremia and diuretic induced renal impairment. With moderate salt restriction, uh, these group required higher doses of diuretic to achieve the required control of ascites. But the development of hyponatremia, renal insufficiency, and other complications were less in this group. In cirrhotic patient, when we asked to take low salt, they had significantly low appetite and low caloric intake, which lead to malnutrition. And malnutrition was associated with increased mortality and portal hypertension related complications. So, after assessing all these facts, guidelines recommended moderate salt restriction to take salt around 5 to 6 grams per day. And about diuretics, the ASLD and ESM European guidelines have a slight different approach. The Americans recommended combined therapy, starting with aldosterone antagonist and loop diuretic in combination, and European guidelines recommended sequential therapy, starting with a low dose aldosterone antagonist and gradually increased diuretic dose depending on the response, and later adding a loop diuretic. So, what is the reason for this difference? So that we will dig more into the pathophysiology. In early stage of decompensation, the effective arterial volume is reduced, and initially, the renin aldosterone angiotensin is get activated, and this aldosterone leads to sodium reabsorption from the distal part of the nephron. But with the progression of the disease, in a perfusion and GFR decreases and sympathetic nervous system gets activated. And here, the sympathetic nervous system acts on the proximal tubule and causes the sodium reabsorption. So in the advanced stages of decompensation, the proximal and the distal part of the tubule both uh, act in the mechanism of ascites development. So in Santos, a study did the study between uh, assessing between the combination and sequential therapy. He found that sequential therapy is better in his study group. And Angeli did the, did the same study and found her combination therapy is better than the sequential therapy in his study group. So, the reason for this difference, the Santos study group 
at 60% with new onset ascites where the aldosterone and renin angiotensin aldosterone system plays a major role and aldosterone and the distal collecting tubules plays the role where we need to start a drug blocking the distal part of the tubule and the aldosterone. So the European the sequential therapy starting with the aldosterone antagonist is the better option in early, early onset ascites. But in Angelis study group, the 70% had recurrent tense ascites. So at the both mechanism, the proximal and distal tubular mechanism, there's a role. So the Euro American system, the combined treatment, the better approach in these patients. So when we started on more diuretics, we have to monitor the weight, blood pressure, electrolyte, renal function, and we have to review the dosing every two to three days. In the involved patient with ascites, the maximum weight loss should be 0.5 kg per day. And if this patient having peripheral edema also, the maximum weight loss should be 1 kg per day. We are monitoring this patient as an outpatient, 2 to 4 kg per week weight loss is recommended. And in cirrhotic patient, the quantity and quality of albumin is reduced. The structure and the functional capacity of albumin is altered, which endangers the oncotic and non-oncotic function of the albumin. So in answer trial and match trial, they studied outpatient weekly albumin administration on cirrhotic patient. And answer trial found 38% reduction in mortality and lower rate of large volume pedacensis, hyponatine, SBP, and HRS. But match trial, there were no difference in mortality or these complications. So difference was in the study design. Match trial was placebo control, randomized control trial. But answer trial was an open label trial where the albumin group had weekly medical follow-up and meta-medical care. An answer trial had a less sicker patient. Male, male score was 12 to 30. Match trial was a well-controlled, passive control study. And there, they had sicker cirrhotic patient. Male score 17 to 18. So after considering all these, No recommendation can be made regarding the outpatient use of albumin in clinical practice. So what about the inpatient use? The ATI trial, they included the sick, cirrhotic patient who were admitted due to cirrhosis-related complication who had albumin level less than 30. And they gave daily IV albumin to maintain albumin more than 30. And in that trial, they the albumin therapy had no clinically important effect on preventing infection and reducing the development of AKI. But significantly, the albumin group, group had severe adversity, mainly the pulmonary edema and fluid overload. So after assessing all these things, now only three indications are there for cirrhotic patients to get IV albumin. That is, if the patient undergoing large volume parasensis, if the patient is having SBP or HRS. So large volume parasensis is the most commonly used treatment option for the sympathetic control. If large volume parasensis is done without plasma expandent, it was associated with 80% incidence of parasensis induced circulatory dysfunction. And repeated LVP is associated with protein loss and electrolyte disturbances. So Jennings did this study assessing the LVP after giving plasma expanded and found that albumin group had a significant improvement. And that improvement is more pronounced when the tap was then more than 5 liters. So what are the other alternatives that we can use to prevent this circulatory dysfunction? In small studies found that terlipacin and noradrenaline are equally effective to albumin. 
and this noradrenaline is very cost effective compared to the other treatment modalities. So when comparing transtibular intrahepatic photosystemic shunts with parasensitive tips associated with lower incidence, better survival than the large volume parasensitive. And also the portal hypertension related complications were less and less hospital admissions were there in this study. And also tips was associated with increased weight, muscle mass, body mass, resting energy expenditure, and energy intake six months after TIPS procedure. So an ALTA consensus in 2020 recommended TIPS should be considered on selected patients with at least three large volume paracensis for 10 CSIDs in a year despite optimal medical therapy. So in TIPS, we are making a shunt connecting the right domain portal vein to the hepatic vein. The aim of TIPS is to make the photosystemic pressure gradient less than 12. Studies have found if we reduce this grade pressure gradient less than 10, it is associated with post-TIPS complications like hepatic dysfunction, hepatic encephalopathy, cardiac dysfunction, and renal dysfunction. Hepatic encephalopathy is the most commonly discussed post-TIPS adverse effect where the study has shown that using a covered stent, low diameter stent, and rifaximin prior to the TIPS procedure and maintaining the photosystemic pressure gradient between 10 to 12 is associated with less incidence of hepatic encephalopathy. So there are contraindications when we are assessing a patient for a TIPS, we have to assess and exclude these contraindications. And also, uh, if elevated bilirubin level, high male score, child score C, and advanced stage, advanced age, these things are associated with increased post-TIPS complication, including mortality. But uh, no studies have proven specific cutoff for the tips. So I wish I had my beta blockers handy. That was the comment made by Sir James Black when he was told that he has won the Nobel Prize for the beta blockers. So when talking about the beta blockers, the crack proposed this window hypothesis where when there is no clinically significant portal hypertension, uh, non-selective beta blockers are not indicated. But when the clinical significant portal hypertension is there, for a, only for a window period, non-selective beta blockers are beneficial. But when in advanced decompensated phase, non-selective beta blockers are harmful. In PEDIS trial, they included compensated cirrhotic patients where the non-selective beta blockers are not indicated according to the uh, available guidelines and uh, knowledge. And they measured the portal, high, portal pressure gradient using the invasive uh, methods. And when if the clinical significant portal hypertension is there, they use this cirrhotic patient and they given they they gave the non-selective beta blockers for these patients and assess the outcomes. In patients who receive non-selective beta blockers with clinically significant portal hypertension had less incidence uh, and re uh, reduced incidence of new onset ascites and development of high risk of varices. In refractory ascites patient, non-selective beta blockers were associated with reduced survival. And also with SBP, it was associated with reduced survival and increased hemodynamic compromise, increased time of hospitalization, and risk of hepatorenal syndrome and AKI. So altogether, 
if patient is child C or married more than 25 and patient is having diuretic intractable refractory anxiety, cardiac index is less than 1.5, systolic blood pressure is less than 90, and within six months after first episode of SPP, we have to withhold non selective beta blocker. If the male is between 18 to 24, with these four complications are there, we have to reduce the non selective beta blocker doses. So, midotrine is a drug, oral vasopressor, which has shown improved clinical outcome and survival in patients with refractory ACID. It significantly reduced the ACIDs, reduced the weight. The important thing is it increased the MAP because the cirrhotic patients have marginal BPs. With use of midodrine, it increased the MAP and also urine sodium excretion and urine volume also increased. And this midodrine group convert diuretic resistant patient back to the diuretic sensitive. And 12 aptan, it will be to receptor antagony. And mainly these studies were from Japan, where they have given low dose 12 aptan for a shorter period of time and had a better survival, better uh, ascites control in this study. This meta analysis have suggested that using 12 aptan, the survival also increased in patients with refractory ascites and patients with hyponatremia. So since 2013, in Japanese guidelines included 12 aptan, they recommended to use 12 aptan at early stage of cirrhosis with the combination of swinolactone and sprucemide. The reason for use this in early stages, the 12 aptan comes with a black box notice. It increases valsier bleeding in cirrhotic patient. So if patient is more than child, patient is child C, better to use it cautiously or not to use 12 aptan. And in heart failure and polycystic kidney disease trials also, they have shown that 12 aptan was associated with hepatotoxicity. But those studies, they use very high doses. So at last, finally, in 2021, American guideline recommended 12 aptan use for cirrhotic patients with hypnotry. But it should be used cautiously for a short period. So take home message, remember the checklist, assess the etiology and monitor the salt and diuretics, no routine albumin for cirrhotic patients and evaluate for tips and early liver transplantation and use your beta blockers handy. And tips is a very high cost procedure. It costs around two to three million for a cost for a tips procedure. So tips is not a good option in Sri Lanka. But if patient is awaiting liver transplantation, we can refer the patient for a tips if indications are there. But if if patient is not suitable for tips, we can consider midodine, which is available in private sector. We can start on 5 milligram BD or TDS and increase daily 2.5 milligram till a map is more than 10. And if patient is in size uh, less than size C and hypovolemic hyponatremia is there with refractory ascites, we can consider 12 aptan. So I would like to thank my trainers, NMM Navaratan, Andy Pires, Niresh Fernand Police, Pudit Risanax and Jani Madam for their input. And thank you.